Uh, hi, everyone. My name is John Howard. I'm a co-founder and creative director at Look. We are a mixed reality design and development studio based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, prior to co-founding the company uh, this past December, I spent two years uh, at Microsoft on the Holland's Experiences team, working with partners like NASA, Autodesk, and Trimble uh, to help them understand and figure out how we're going to bring Holland's and mixed reality to the world. And then prior to that, I spent 15 years as a creative director and principal designer in the interactive entertainment and video game industry. So today what I want to talk about is spatial UX uh, and spatial UI. Um, I think we've all seen reports like this, and I think we can discuss the time frame and the dollar amounts, but there is definitely a growing consensus that uh, virtual reality and mixed reality are really becoming the next major technology disruption, that tomorrow's 3D glasses are going to replace today's 2D flat screens. But in order to make this reality, um, there's a set of real challenges that we need to overcome. And one of the most significant of those challenges is that most UX design is still focused on flat 2D screens. That over the past 30 years, the difference between a Macintosh's interface and an iPhone's interface isn't fundamentally different. You've got icons, you've got scrolling text, you've got radio buttons, and frankly, the content isn't fundamentally different. It's text, it's videos, it's photos. And there's a pretty big gap between there and true spatial experiences, as well as the UI and UX required to actually enable those experiences. And so if we're going to make that leap from, uh, if we make that leap to virtual reality and mixed reality revolution really happen, we need to answer a fundamental question. And that question is, how do we make the jump from 2D to 3D? Um, and the temptation, especially coming from a video game background, is to look at movies and video games for inspiration. But the problem when we try and turn those fictions into reality uh, is that they don't quite translate the way we want them to. So, for instance, locking a bunch of UI to Tony Stark's head looks great in a movie, but when he turns to look at this thing up to his left, his whole frame of reference moves, and this thing in front of my eye really gets in my way is annoying. And this, frankly, isn't comfortable for more than 10 minutes, let alone eight hours. Um, and even if we look at video games where there's actually more interactivity, a lot of the tricks we use in immersive video games don't work here. For instance, this menu is actually being rendered as a separate render pass. And in fact, if it were actually in front of the character where the character could see it, the bottom half of that menu would be clipping through that table and it would be completely unusable. And so there are real challenges to creating real functional UX and UI for spatial experiences. Um, and building a robust and well understood toolbox for those experiences is necessary. And so what I want to talk about today is some of the work being done to tackle those real challenges. Um, I think the good news is that there are, these problems are being worked on right now and that these new rules of spatial UX and UI are still being written. And this kind of innovation is actually happening daily and I really think that now is the time for all of us to really become part of that discussion to drive that forward because that's what's going to make this happen and make this real. Um, this is a, what I call the spatial UI, spatial UX toolbox. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, the emphasis in the examples I'm going to show is on mixed reality because that's where a lot of my experience and background is, but I believe that a lot of what this uh, shows is also strongly applicable to VR as well. Um, and in fact, this isn't even a comprehensive list, and I'm not even going to get into all of it because I don't, have, I don't have the full time, so I'm going to go into a subsection of this uh, in today's talk. Uh, so to start at the top of this list, this is actually something that Microsoft created to showcase Halo 5 at E3 of last year. This is actually an in-fiction briefing for a new multiplayer experience that, uh, for Halo 5 that was being revealed at the show. And one of the things I want to point out as I roll this video is that in this, the user is fundamentally a passive participant. They're only required to look around and take in what they see. Welcome aboard the UNSC Infinity. Today's simulation takes place on the planet before you. You'll need to have intimate knowledge of this area if you want to be successful from the very start of the simulation. This is an Elder Hunter. He is extremely strong against a frontal assault. I've dropped some additional info on the comm chips in front of you. Grab those chips on your way out the door for later review. So what I like about this example is I think it shows that really powerful experiences can be created with minimal action required by the user. The simple fact that we know where the user is looking 
is a very, very powerful tool for creating dynamic experiences. And I think one area, there are a couple areas where this applies, and where I really, my, my, where my mind really goes is if we think about museum or theme park settings, places where we have really high user throughput, where we want to ask minimal sort of uh, requirements or understand the technology from a user, just building experiences around user gaze can be really, really powerful and really, really effective. Um, I think one note of caution here, I think anyone that's had experience of some of the early Google Cardboard stuff can attest to this, that sort of aggressive or excessive event triggering based purely on gaze is kind of like giving a user a load of gun and strapping it to their face. You get a little gun shy about looking at everything when menus are popping up and things are executing constantly. So again, it can be incredibly powerful, but there's some, uh, some balance required there. Um, gaze cursor is something that I actually differentiate from user gaze because now we're starting to prompt the user to take direct action. Uh, this is an example, this is actually created by the object theory up in Portland, um, and what they've done here is, what I like is they've actually created a, a gaze cursor that's based as a, on a 3D object, so as it traverses across the surfaces, you actually get a sense of the contours of those objects. They're also smoothing that plumb bob, and my video stopped looping, which is awesome. Uh, uh, if anyone knows why that happens, I'd love to understand why. Uh, it, as it traces across those surfaces, uh, they're actually smoothing that motion so it's not snapping. And in fact, perfect gaze feels really jittery and, and aggressive. Smoothing that out a little bit, giving a little bit of lag, uh, helps uh, make it feel very stable and very, very uh, 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 much more consistent for the, for the user. Um, here's another example where instead of an object, they've actually used a spotlight. I think this works great in this context because you have these uneven surfaces, you have contours of skin, and uh, let me test something really quick. Let me try this again. Will it play now? Hey, great. Um, what you're seeing here is you're seeing as you move across those surfaces, you get a much better sense of the skeletal system versus the skin versus the different layers of the body. I think it does a really good job of giving those surfaces a tactile feel when they're uneven. Um, Raphael talked a little about this in his talk, and I actually wanted to get into it a little bit more. I think as designers, uh, we often don't think about sound and audio. Um, I think that we, when we do that, we miss an opportunity to communicate more information and through a different set of senses. So just the same way we can parallel input into the user through, an, through the audio system as, a, to, uh, you know, as opposed to just purely visual. Um, as Raphael talked about, audio really helps you find objects that move outside of your field of view. It also makes them physically present in the world. This is a, a quick screenshot from RoboRaid for HoloLens created by L LXP, LXP Studio at Microsoft. And everything in this scene has an audio source attached to it, and that's, that's being presented spatially. So it's really helping those things not only track them as you move around the environment, but also make them much more physically present in that world, because if you're telling my brain that I can see it and I can hear it, well, then it must be real. And this has really practical applications outside of just entertainment. So uh, thinking about a remote collaboration series, we're using avatars. Even with very simple avatars, with very, very minimal uh, differentiation, just color and a label, as long as my voice or your voice comes from where that avatar is, I can track that avatar and I think of it as you. Uh, so, I get a little flack for using the word haptic here because haptic technically means touch, but I think that audio is a very powerful way to, make, to, to, to give us a, a physical sense of objects. So another way to think about this is sort of audio force feedback. So I'm gonna play a quick clip here. Um, this is gonna play without audio, and then it's gonna play with. So what I like about this is I think this reinforces how audio makes virtual objects not just present but tactile, and giving these objects organic sounds tells us what type of materials they're made of, and so it helps us understand how we're gonna interact with them and what the, what the behavior's gonna be, right? If something is marble or it's wood, if it sounds hollow when I tap on it versus solid when I tap on it, it's gonna tell me if it's heavy, if I'm gonna be able to move it. All sorts of different things can be communicated just by giving audio and giving elements a, a, a haptic element even thinking about combining this with gaze cursor. As I move my gaze across a rough surface versus a smooth surface, how do those sound different? And it sounds a little weird, but, if, but in a lot of these experiences, if you don't have hand controllers, your eyes become your hands. And so giving something a sense of touch just by using audio uh, can be really, really powerful for, for completing that, that illusion that that thing is there and that is real. And I think this has real practical applications as well. So if we look at this project with Autodesk at Microsoft, that, UI element has a click, click, click sound attached to it. 
that tells me how it works. It's a graduated element like a ratchet. It's not a smooth action, so I have a better understanding how it's gonna work. Um, we can even use this to create a sixth sense to warn users of proximity of nearby hazards. So everyone here has played, I'm sure, Operation, right? You take the metal tweezers, you go into the little hole, you try to take out the plastic piece, if you touch the metal side, you get a buzz. Well, imagine as my tweezers got closer to those metal sides, I got a hum sound that told me that I was getting into danger. And this sounds silly in this application, but imagine it integrated into an industrial hard hat that hums when I get close to high power sources, even if I back up into them. You can literally give human beings six senses by, by integrating this kind of technology and by giving uh, elements in the world uh, audio signatures that can feed information into the user. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges in this type of UI UX is the lack of the frame. I think designers coming from a flat UI UX background are used to anchoring information and controls to the edge of the frame and filling the center of it with content. But in VR and mixed reality, there is no frame. And so figuring out where we anchor this information can be really, really tricky and is one of the biggest challenges to overcome for building real applications. Um, this is an indoor agriculture operation where all the sensor and control data for this environment is actually anchored in the context of the real world. And in fact, the controls are integrated through pop-up menus. So if I look here at section 55, not only can I get all the information about it, but the nutrient uh, lighting and hydration sensors and controls are all integrated into that environment and I can pop those out with a, with a context menu. Uh, this is an example of the work we did with NASA. And this is bringing up contextually relevant information. So what I have here integrated is all of the tools for the Mars Curiosity rover to do different types of science. And I can get to those by just accessing a, a pop-up context menu. So I'll run this again. So again, just by looking at a place on the terrain, air tapping or clicking, I get access to all of these tools. I can go into one of these tools, set that tool here in the environment, and then get all the sub, uh, the, 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 the settings for that tool uh, to do right there. So as a really simple interface, just by using gaze and a single click, like, like a single button on a mouse or a, a gesture like you have on the HoloLens, you can do very complex actions. Um, this is a great project done by the Medisim Group at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, and they use a very similar flyout method for conveying information. One of the challenges here that I think is, is, is this, this points out though is the menu flies out so far from the hand that the context of the object is lost as I try and travel my gaze across and actually look at those elements you know, on that menu. So thinking about the arrangement between those nested actions in a context menu and the context where you're actually trying to, to, to make that action happen is really, really important to consider. Uh, and this is unrelated, but I thought it was just a great example. They've actually built an x-ray into this uh, abdominal dummy that allows uh, medical students to actually test sort of palpating different organs. They're actually projecting uh, an x-ray of the organs inside the body. So as I physically touch this dummy, uh, I'm actually seeing the organs inside the body so I have a great visual reference. I thought it was a beautiful use of, of, of mixed reality and bringing touch into uh, the equation. Um, so again, a couple notes of caution here from experience. Uh, context menus work really, really well, but when you have high density, uh, environments can be really, really challenging or tricky. Think about a city map where you have a lot of tall buildings sticking up. You want that menu to be anchored to the same Z depth as the thing you want to interact with, but if there are buildings in the way, well, now I can't see the menu or the menu is drawing through it, so I have a weird sort of occlusion Z fighting issue. If the menu is up here, then, I, then I'm not looking at my subject matter. Again, some of these solutions work in every circumstance. Some of them, they have to be tuned or, or, or reconsidered for different types of circumstances. Uh, and then the last one is just thinking again about uh, pop-up menus and how far those flyouts run from each other. Um, Extended desktop, so this is actually more unique to mixed reality applications like HoloLens, but I think some of the lessons here are universal. When we started working with architects uh, and industrial designers on some of these projects at Microsoft, one of the things we found was that there was a lot of resistance to adopting new tools that didn't take into account their existing workflows. If we can build tools, if we can take the best things about virtual reality and mixed reality, and we can show how they integrate into the existing tool, tool chains, workflows, and processes. Users are gonna be more uh, willing to adopt those, those tools and processes. One area where I'll, I'll gently disagree with Raphael, who was up here before, is I actually think that the mouse and touch screens are incredibly valuable tools to continue to use because they are very, very familiar to users. There are circumstances where they do not work, and I think if you're trying to create immersive entertainment, they may not be the best tools, but for a lot of productivity applications, they are still incredibly valuable. This is an example we did with, with NASA where 
the way to think about this is literally think about the world around you as an extension of your computer desktop. The, the area of interaction does not end at the edge of the monitor. And so when this video loops again, hopefully this one will loop, um, what we'll see here is he literally takes the mouse off screen and clicks on the terrain and then gets up and goes and walks over to it. So in this circumstance, using a mouse versus using gaze and gesture, the system treats both of those as equal types of input. And whatever, you're, whatever is most useful for that immediate situation or most comfortable for that individual user is what matters the most and how, how they're gonna actually interact with it. Uh, and this can be incredibly important for trying to get users who are um, uh, either resistant or uncomfortable with new technology but very familiar with the technology they have to sort of dip their toe in the pool of using this technology, of, the, of these new systems of virtual reality and, and mixed reality. Um, this is another project we did. This is the Autodesk project again. One of the things here you'll notice is that the hologram and what's happening on the screen, when a change happens on screen, it happens on the hologram. When a change happens on the hologram, it happens on screen. Thinking about those things as synchronized systems and making the spatial applications part of the production, production pipeline, not just isolated islands, is incredibly powerful and incredibly useful for, for, for getting the best out of your VR mixed reality application while still getting the best out of your traditional 2D desktop or mobile application. Uh, and then finally, again, these keyboards, mice, and touch screens remain familiar and precise input devices. And it's great to be able to use their familiarity and precision as part of spatial applications. So here's an example where we have a physical model with a holographic element in, in the middle of it. And we've actually taken the mouse, walked away from the, taken our Bluetooth mouse, walked away from the computer, and are now using it to manipulate within this, within this uh, uh, 3D environment. Um, and again, another note of caution here, one thing that I, this isn't called out in any of those videos, but for example, if I were to use a mouse and to drag it from this podium onto the floor, there's a pretty big difference in depth so that mouse is gonna snap. Smoothing that transition and actually creating a little ray that shows that the mouse is moving down will not only make that feel more comfortable, more natural, but if there are other users observing that action, it will allow them to track where that is going because ultimately you're, you're, you're moving that mouse from the point from the POV of one user and so other users need to be able to understand how that, how that mouse is gonna move. Um, so again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just scratching the surface. Uh, but I think that for me, Again, this, this, this virtual reality, mixed reality uh, revolution, I think is coming fast. And that flat UX and UI that we've been working on for 30 years isn't completely sufficient to solve these problems. That these new standards are being developed right now and being created, but there's still a lot of discovery to happen in this space. Uh, and finally, if there's sort of one big lesson that I can leave anyone with who wants to go and venture into this space, it's this, right? Lots of what we thought was gonna work didn't. Lots of the solutions from flat UX that we tried didn't translate. And even what works in one circumstance isn't guaranteed to work in another circumstance. So the one thing I would just encourage everyone to do is sort of inner, you know, channel your inner Tony Stark and always be prototyping and always try to build new stuff. Uh, thank you.